me just say this, as we turn to John 13, we really enter the upper room where Jesus spends his last his special hours, really, with the 12. Some have said that John 13, the upper room, that those hours that Jesus was with his disciples before the crucifixion, when we enter there, we step on holy ground. The holy of holies, you might say. And it's because it's Jesus's farewell address, and it contains, you ready? I think this is how important these chapters are. It contains all that is necessary to live life more abundantly, as Jesus called it in John 10 and verse 10. And really, it all comes down to one thing, and that is this. It comes down to the condition of your inner person. It comes down to the condition of your heart and that your heart is surrendered to the Lord and that you are relying upon him from your heart. That's what these chapters are about. It's in these chapters that Jesus talks more about the Holy Spirit than he ever did in all of his earthly ministry. He talks about the Holy Spirit because he is the key person when we're talking about the heart. So with that in mind, uh, let's begin because he, in the first 17 verses, deals with the purity of our heart. And then there's the betrayal of Judas that is predicted, and that deals with the reality of our heart. And then he closes with, uh, with Peter uh, who thinks that he's not going to deny the Lord. And Jesus gives that new command to his people that we should love one, one another. There's the charity that's to be in the heart. Let's pause and pray. Father, I'm thankful this morning for John 13 and for the chapters that follow that, what is called the upper room discourse, your, your last words to your disciples before Calvary. They are so vital for us to look at and to understand. And so as we look at chapter 13 this morning, we're just asking for your help. We're never going to be able to get from it what we need to without your guidance. So open our spiritual eyes, enlighten our hearts today with the truth that you have for us. And we pray that in doing so, we would, uh, again, listen, take heed, listen, and become not just hearers, but also doers of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. That is for his glory, as he knows our needs in our heart today. Amen. So let's talk about the purity of the heart that really is pictured in Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But the purity of our heart is connected with several things that Jesus knew. And we're told that in these verses. If you look at verses 1 and 2, it says, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus, noticed this, knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto his Father, and having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end, and supper being ended, the devil having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing, there it is again, that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, that's when he acted by taking that basin of water and the towel to wash his disciples' feet. Several things that Jesus knows. When we talk about the purity of the heart, we ought to come to grips with the fact that Jesus knows some things that we don't know. One thing that he is very clear on is the plan. He's very uh, clear on the fact that his life was about to end. In fact, in the 11th verse, we read, he knew who should betray him. He knew that the end was near. He knew God's plan. He knew the specific time that the redemption plan that had been put into place from all eternity would actually be lived out and would come to completion. Remember, often in the Gospel of John, 
Jesus will say, my hour has not yet come. My time has not yet come. But now he knew God's plan, and he knew that his time would come, and that his life would come to an end. But in verse 1, it's very clear, his love would never come to an end for his people. He would love them to the end, to the horizon. It reminds me of what the prophet Jeremiah says about his love for Israel. We think that God's washed his hands of Israel. He's done with them because they blew off the Messiah, right? No. He said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Never going to end. He loves them. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He's chastening them severely, has been, will, until they say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And I'm also thankful that he loves us, his church, to the end. The Bible says in Romans 8, and it's such a wonderful chapter, that nothing will ever be able to separate God's people from his love. He's going to love us and nothing, none, no situation you ever find yourself in will ever separate you from his love. So he knew the plan. And that's something to keep in mind because without the plan of redemption happening, there'd be no purity of heart available to us. Here's another thing he knew. He knew his power. He knew the power. In that uh, third verse, he talks about the fact that uh, that he knew that all authority uh, had been given to him from his father. So he knew that as a result of this glorification that would come through his crucifixion, that it would end up in his exaltation, that he would reign authoritatively over all. You remember what he said just before he left this earth? He said to his disciples, all authority is mine in heaven and in earth because he followed through with the Father's plan. And the wonderful thing is that authority, that power is the key to our victory and not being defeated in the Christian lives that we are to live day in and day out. And so he knew the plan. He knew the power. He knew the place. In the third verse, he, he says that uh, he knew that he was come from God and he went to God. He knew that originally he came from heaven and he knew that that was his destination. That's where he was headed. That's where he was going. Um, it's not the first time he said that to people. In this gospel of John, he made it very clear in the eighth chapter that he was God and that he had come from heaven. That's his origin and that his destiny is there as well. And by the way, we haven't gotten there yet. But in this upper room discourse, you're going to find those wonderful words when Jesus reassures his disciples and said, he says to them, I'm going to go away. I'm going to my father's house. I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you to myself, that where I am in my father's house, here you will be also. So he knows the plan. He knows the place. He knows the power. But also, he knows who are his people. In that uh, second verse of chapter 2, uh, he realizes that the devil had put in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. That gets repeated again in verse 11, as we've already looked at. But uh, look at verse 38, the end of the last verse, uh, where Jesus says to Peter, you're going to lay down your life for me? I'm telling you, you're going to deny me. You know what this demonstrates to us? That Jesus knows people. In fact, in chapter 2 and verse 25, you may not recall this, but Jesus didn't reveal himself to men because he knew what was in their heart. God knows what's in human hearts. And he knew that there was going to be a demonic betrayal on the part of Judas Iscariot. He knew that there was going to be an evil denial on the part of uh, Peter because he knows the human heart. He sees right through. He knows exactly what's going on in your mind right now and what has happened in your life this week. He knows all about us. He sees right through us. We can put on airs and we can 
live hypocritically and make people think we're something that we're not. But Jesus sees right through us. He knows people. And that's why he says to Samuel, when Samuel is anointing the next king of Israel, don't look on the height of their stature. Don't look on their outward appearance. But, but uh, he says, do what I do. Look on the heart. Because God looks on the heart. He knows people. He knows the heart. And then we really get to really the heart of this passage of purity when we pick it up in verse 4, where Jesus actually takes the basin and the towel to go around and wash his disciples' feet. And this is uh, what I would call uh, perhaps the fifth thing that Jesus knows. You know what he knows? He knows that in order to be his partner, in order to partner with the Lord in the work that he wants to accomplish, you have to have purity in your heart. You have to have a clean heart. And so verses 4 to 17 are all about this partnership. Uh, the the uh, first three verses really are connected with several things that Jesus knows. He knows the plan. He knows the power. He knows the place. He knows the people. He knows the, the partnership. But beginning of verse 4 and him washing the disciples' feet, this is the one thing Jesus did. He used what he knew and went to work to give people that he was going to use clean hearts. It's real symbolism here. It's a great object lesson. He says in verse 5, after he poureth water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that he had in his belt that he was girded with. Dirty feet. <laughs> Defiled. Dirty feet here. By the way, in this uh, Middle Eastern setting that this uh, account takes place, it was the responsibility of every host to provide water for a designated slave to wash the feet of the guests in that home. Jewish people did not wash one another's feet. They felt that that was beneath them. Now, it could have happened in certain circumstances, but no rabbi, which Jesus was, no rabbi would ever wash his disciples' feet. This is totally against culture. So Jesus, he washes his disciples' feet because he's trying to make a point, a very important point. He's trying to emphasize the necessity of a pure heart, of a clean heart, of purity, because the dirty feet of these disciples, of course, their feet get dirty. It's a, it's a dusty, sandy area. And all of they have all they have is open sandals. And so you walk any distance, you're gonna have dirty feet. And so that's why there was this foot uh, uh, the the foot washing that was part of their culture. But Jesus is making it very clear as you read these verses that he's not just washing their feet, he's giving them a, an object lesson. This is a visual, and we shouldn't miss it. Look at what he says here. He, uh, he gets to Peter's feet, and Peter said, Lord, uh, you're going to wash my feet? In other words, uh-uh. That's what Peter's saying in verse 6. And Jesus said, well, Peter, you know, what I'm doing now, you don't know, but you're going to know hereafter. In other words, I'm doing more than just putting water on your feet and wiping them with a towel. And then Peter responds again in verse 9, and he says, Lord, uh, or verse 8, Peter said, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. And then Jesus says this, and here's where the object lesson really hits home. Jesus said, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. You're not a partner with me. So Jesus is emphasizing the necessity of an inner purity. Dirty feet are symbolic of your inner life. 
and our inner life gets dirtied by self-interest, by selfishness, by always focusing on ourselves, and even by having a self-righteous heart where we think that we know better than other believers, we think that we're a cut above the, the, the rest because we have done this or we believe that. And so he's dealing with defiled inner man. He's dealing with the heart that is dirtied by self-interest and self-righteousness. Not to mention anything. Peter wasn't, he wasn't cheating on his wife. Uh, Peter was not robbing the treasury among the disciples. But Peter had a dirty heart. He needed his heart cleansed, just as we do. But what happens in these verses that I've read, verses 6 to 8, though his heart is defiled as pictured by the washing of his feet, he's defiant to what God's trying to do for him. He's defiant about the Lord washing his feet. The focus in these verses is on Peter rejecting what Jesus wants to do for him. But that rejection is followed then by Jesus' correction of Peter, his wrong thinking. When Peter says what he does in verse 8, thou shalt never wash my feet, it's not obvious in the English in the English language, but in the language the New Testament was written in originally, he uses a double negative. You will never, no, never wash my feet. In other words, he was totally emphatic. It is not going to happen, ever. That's what he's saying to Jesus. He's defiant. He's defiled. He's also defiant. You know, you can sit here this morning or you can be listening online sometime now or later. And you can honestly be a saved person. You can be a believer in this book, the Bible, from cover to cover. You can even witness for the Lord, and you can give great testimonies, and you can even have a special area of service for the Lord, even an official office. And you can be like Peter, defiled and defiant in your heart. The success in serving the Lord, the success in following the Lord, it requires that we, as his partners, have a cleansed heart, have a clean heart. Now, notice again, he's cleansed by this picture of the feet, which is picturesque of the defilement in the heart that needs to be cleansed. We should ask ourselves, Do you consider yourself to be a partner with the Lord? Well, you're not really a partner with the Lord unless you can also sit here and attest to the fact that my heart's clean before the Lord. I have a clean heart. Because he says very clearly in this uh, eighth verse to Peter, if I don't wash you, notice this, you have absolutely no part with me. You can't serve me. You can't partner with me. There's no partnership with me unless I cleanse your defilement. Successful service requires partnership with the living Christ, but partnership with Christ requires purity of the heart. And so this puts Peter in another mode. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, Lord, don't stop with my feet. He says, wash my hands and my head also. And Jesus answers in verse 10, Peter, something you need to understand. He that's washed needs not except to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean is what he's saying here. So from defiled in his heart, to defiant in his heart, to now being desperate in his heart by his reply in that ninth verse. Because here is Peter that when you read the Gospels, he was the leader of the pack, right? 
he was the spokesman often for the 12. And he was the, he, he was just like the natural leader. And so Jesus is informing him that here is a man that had such great part in the ministry of Jesus with the other disciples. And Jesus says, you're going to go from having a great part to having no part at all. And that idea broke him. And it brought surrender to his heart. And that's what he's saying when he says what he does in verse 9. He said, then I want... I want all the defilement in my life washed away. I don't want to pretend anymore. I don't want even the least speck of it left in my life because I want as much part with you. I want to partner with you as much as I can. He's desperate at this point. And Jesus explains to him in the 10th verse, he that is washed, and that is a word that means to completely bathe the whole body. And that is a also a in a tense that is once and for all. He's referring to salvation. When you are saved, you're washed. And it's a once and for all act. You don't have to get saved over and over and over again. It's a once and for all act, and it lasts. But he says, there's the, the word washed in the past tense, right? Then he says, uh, needeth not save or accept to wash, present tense, something that happens over and over again. It's a different word. The word washed and the word wash are two separate words. Washed means total bath, but this word wash means to simply cleanse. It's the difference between a relationship with the Lord that is established at salvation once and for all, and then ongoing fellowship with the Lord, which requires cleansing, which requires the feet washing picture. You know, there are layers of unconfessed sin that need to be stripped away from our lives. If you really want to be clean in heart, you need to get before the Lord in a quiet place and ask him to show you, if you're not aware of anything, to show you, to speak to your heart and show you anything that is sinful in your life. And when he shows you that, own it, confess it, and then ask him, is there anything else? Is there anything else? Is there anything else? So that you can be certain that you have a pure heart that you can totally confess. And then what happens after this is he gives direction to his disciples. By the way, when he says the last three words of verse 10, you're clean, but not all, he tells us what he meant by that in verse 11. There was one of the 12 disciples that, weren't, that, that wasn't clean, and that was Judas Iscariot. He was just playing the part. He was just going along with the program. He was just pretending to be a partner, but he really wasn't. He was a plant. He was an imposter. He was a man that really, he, he didn't have the reality of Christ in his life. But look at what it says in verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had, and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me master and Lord, you, and that's right. You say, well, so, for so I am. If I then your Lord and master, verse 14, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He's giving them direction here. Do as I have done. Serve one another. You know what the essence of the Christian life really is about? It is rescuing and restoring believers, brothers and sisters, not stomping on them when they're down, but rescuing them and helping them up and restoring them. In fact, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, if any man is overtaken in a fault, that is caught red-handed, let him that is spiritual 
Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering themselves, lest they also be tempted. In other words, lest you you think that you're better than them, you're not. You're you can fall just as easily as they can. So be in that rescue restoration mode. That's really the essence of a happy Christian life. He's talking about the reality of it here, beginning in verse 18 and down to uh, verse 30. He says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I've chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth his bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now, who do you think that might be? That's actually an illusion, if not a very quote from one of the Psalms. There are several Psalms that talk and, and prophesy the betrayal of Judas. And so he is speaking about that. He says in verse 19, now I tell you before it come that when it has come to pass, you might believe that I am. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth Whomsoever I send receiveth me, he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. What these verses are about are reality. He's talked about purity. Now he's talking about reality. Real, sincere loyalty is the issue in these verses. Judas was a hypocrite. Judas was a pretender. Judas was an imposter. He appeared to be one of the twelve. He appeared to be like all the rest of them. He went through the motions. He did what they did. He followed the party line, so to speak. He had the all outward appearance of being one of them when, in fact, his heart was not right. His heart was never purified. He was never washed. He just was going along with it. And you know what? You say, how could that be? The 12 themselves, the disciples, didn't even know their own heart. Because when Jesus in that upper room said, you know, one of you is going to betray me, they didn't know who that might be. They thought it might be them. They didn't even know their own heart. And they had no clue that it was Judas that Jesus was talking about. But Judas, but Jesus knew. Here's something that I want you to really understand. The fact that the Psalms prophesied this about Judas, the fact that Jesus predicted this, knew it, does not mean that because God foreknew that Judas would do this, that he caused Judas to do this. Can I repeat that? The fact that God foreknows things does not make God the cause of things. God foreknows evil that's going to happen, that that doesn't make God the cause of the evil that happens. Judas sinned of his own free will. Judas did exactly what Judas wanted to do because he was not happy. He was bitter. He was disillusioned. Jesus wasn't the Messiah that he envisioned him to be. And so he was money hungry. He was a thief. He was greedy. And so he got paid off. And he was bribed in order to betray Jesus. It all fits into it. And the 12, they're ignorant of this fact about Jesus. In fact, when Jesus takes that special piece, that piece of bread of honor called the sop, and he dips it and he gives it to Judas, he's showing honor to Judas. He's showing affection to Judas. He's showing friendship with Judas. And it says at that point, look at verse 27. After the sop, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus said to him, that thou doest, do quickly. Verse 28, now no man, the other 11, at the table knew not for what intent that he spake this unto him. They didn't have a clue. Judas is a tragic character in the scripture. He had all the opportunity, all the opportunity, many times to really repent, to really get saved, to really be washed. And he threw it all away. And here's the truth. To despise and to insult the mercy of God by deliberately refusing to repent 
it does great damage to the human heart and it brings a person to an awful destiny in the end and that's what happened to him i think about this verse this is hebrews 10 and verse 28 it says he that despised moses's law died without mercy under two or three witnesses listen of how much worse punishment suppose you ye shall be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the son of god hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despot or insult unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. You don't mess around with God's mercy. You don't play around with the opportunity that God gives you to repent. This is hard to explain and hard to understand, but there's truth here that whenever you do despot or insult to the mercy of God, deliberately refusing to repent, you do damage in your inner man. You do damage in your heart. And I don't know when God says that's enough. Then the last part of this 13th chapter, uh, let's pick it up in verse 31. Therefore, now when he was gone out, that is Judas, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now God is glorified in him. After Judas, Judas left the room, that upper room, I think that's the exact time when Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. When he took that, that uh, Passover meal and instituted communion. Because the basis is for genuine, sincere, loyal heart for Christ is, is really charity. You know what charity is? A Bible word. We don't use it. Today, charity is given to the poor, right? Uh, but in the Bible, charity is a self-sacrificing love that is only accomplished in the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, that's a word that's missing. I think we we, we miss that word. It's It's been redefined. And I think that's why uh, the translators use the word charity in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a specific word that really, uh, in that day, it characterized what God's love was about, a self-sacrificing love. Charity. Of course, that characterizes Jesus' love in that first verse of this chapter. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Charity. This divine love, this divine self-sacrificing love is eternal. He loved them unto the end. Jesus' love for the world is an eternal thing. It results in salvation but also it's a spiritual thing. Notice verses 34 and 35. Jesus says to his little children, these 11 that are left, you know, you're going to look for me, but I'm going to be gone. And where I'm going now, you can't come at this point. You'll come later, but you can't come now. And then he said, but before I go, I want to give you a new commandment. And the commandment is charity. Listen to it that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. That is a love that is spiritual. It's a love for brothers and sisters in the Lord. By the way, the Jewish people say there's 613 commands in the Torah. Here's Jesus' one command, because it sums up every other command. Here's one command. Here it is, that you love and that you love one another. And notice a new commandment. What's new about it? Well, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's new. Love as Jesus loved us. That's a different kind of love. That's not a human love. 
That's a divine love. It's a divine self-sacrificing love. It's a love that you and I don't have. It's a love that is able to forgive all faults. It's a love that is able to uh, love the unlovable. It is a love that can only be exhibited and exercised when we are depending upon the Spirit of God that has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts to produce it through us. It's a spiritual love. It's not a human love. That's what's new about it. It's Jesus' love, and it's not humanly produced. It's supernaturally produced by the Spirit of God in us. Then look at Peter's temporary love that's mentioned here in verse 37 and 38. Peter, uh, Jesus, again, uh, Peter asked the question, why can't we go where you're going? Don't you know? We'll follow you to the death. Jesus says in verse 38, <laughs> you think so? You, you're going to lay down your life for my sake? Let me tell you something about your heart that you don't know. You're going to deny me three times. That's temporary love. That's not divine self-sacrificing love that Peter is going to, that, that Peter has at this point. Peter's love is, a, is just a friendship love. You know, I'm your friend as, all, as long as things are going well. A fair weather friend, I think they used to call them. Um, it's not Christ's love. You know, there's a danger of overstating your devotion, your affection, your love for the Lord, overestimating it, thinking that you love the Lord more than you really do. Because when push comes to shove, then it really becomes evident. And he failed. He failed. And so have you. And so have I. We fail. We overestimate ourselves. But Jesus doesn't live, leave us there in our failure. He shows up at the Sea of Galilee. And there's Peter. He's out in the fishing boat. And Jesus is on the shore. And he hollers to them, Children, have you caught anything to eat? Here's these seasoned fishermen, Peter, James, John. They knew how to fish. They knew when to fish. They knew how to fish. They knew where to fish. That was their livelihood right there on that Sea of Galilee. And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. And Jesus says, well, then just cast the net on the other side of the, of the ship and you'll catch something. Oh, yeah, sure. This is the second time that kind of stuff had happened. And so they did it and so many fish. <laughs> Their ship began to sink. They could hardly haul it in. And the, the net didn't even break. Every single fish was kept. And then that sets up breakfast. They get to shore with their fish, but Jesus had already miraculously had fish and bread cooking on a charcoal fire there on the shoreline. And after, they, after they eat... Then Jesus has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Peter about his love. Three times Peter denied the Lord. Three times Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Third time, Peter, do you love me? Because he didn't say this, but I'm thinking it. Because you denied me three times. So I'm going to ask you the third time, Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Yes, Peter. And Peter breaks at this time again. And he says, Lord, I don't know. You know. You know all things. You know whether I love you. I don't know whether I love you, but you do. You know whether I love you or not. Feed my sheep. To feed means to total care for them. To completely tend for all of their needs. The mature, the young, the immature, the lambs. Here's the thing. 
You know what charity is? You know what this new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you involves? It means that if you have love for Jesus, you're not going to talk about how much you love him, but you're going to prove it by investing your life in serving and blessing others. That's what it's about. That's the proof of charity. You know what? If the Lord doesn't give us that, we'd have been out of here a long time ago. It's really what it comes down to. The abundant life that Jesus mentions in John 10.10 10 begins when our hearts are pure, purified by him, when we are in real fellowship with him and not putting on pretenses, and when we are living lives to serve one another. In doing so, we bring him glory. It's as simple as that. During World War II, Hitler commanded all religious groups to unite so that he could control them all. And among the brethren assemblies in Germany, half of them complied with Hitler's uh, command and half of them refused. Well, of course, those that went along with Hitler's directive uh, they had a much easier time than the ones that refused to. Those that refused faced real harsh persecution. And in almost uh, every family in those that refused, at least one family member died in a concentration camp. So when the war was over, you can imagine there were deep, bitter feelings between these two groups. There was a lot of tension. They didn't know what to do. So finally, they decided that uh, the situation had to be healed. It couldn't go on any longer. They couldn't be at odds with one another any longer. So the leaders from each group met at a quiet retreat. And just for several days, each person spent time in prayer, examining his own heart in light of Scripture. And then they came together at the end of several days. Francis Schaeffer who told the incident, he asked a friend who was there, what did you do then? And here's what he said. We were just one. As they confessed their hostility and bitterness to God and yielded to his control, the Holy Spirit created a unity among them and love filled their hearts and dissolved all of their hatred. You see, when love prevails among believers, especially in times of, of hurt and strong disagreement, when love prevails, it provides the world an indisputable mark that we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the greatest hallmark of believers. By this shall all the world, all men, know that you're my disciples. If you have this charity, this divine self-sacrificing love one for another, let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this 13th chapter of John. It is really so needed in our lives. We want this purity of heart. We want this reality of purity in our lives. We want this charity that is a result of a pure heart and a dependence upon you to be shed abroad in our lives, that we would love one another as you have loved us, as you do love us, that we might have that testimony before the world that otherwise we'd never have. We just pray, Lord, that you would use this to bring about the change in our hearts that you desire. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Your head's bowed yet, your eyes closed. Just a moment before we sing our closing number. Is Are you seated here today? Are you clean in heart? Is there something that defiles that Jesus needs to cleanse. You need to own up to it, that he needs to cleanse. Is your profession 
matched by your day in and day out life? Is it words or is it reality? Because it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know. That's what you really believe. The life you live reveals what you really believe. And then, what about the charity? The reality is seen in your charity. The reality is seen in your love for one another. Does it bother you that your brother or sister is hurting? Do you have a heart to help? Is there any compassion there to help in any way? Or do we just go about our own business, mind our business, and look out for number one, which is me, self? See, if God's dealing with your heart, settle it right now, okay? Don't, don't put it off. Settle it right now. Let God have his way. Let's do that.